Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, staying with us for this uh, last and highly anticipated session that I'm very excited to introduce and um, be a part of today. Uh, so very happy to introduce um, to uh, PISS prophets um, as they've been proclaimed uh, in the social media world, uh, Jay Seltzer um, and Juan Carlos Velez, and I'll let them both introduce themselves. And this is the first time that we're doing this session and uh, really, really excited. And I think everyone is in for a treat. Um, so thanks to both of you, and uh, I'll hand it over to, to you, Jay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Juan Carlos to get us started. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Samir, and everybody. Thanks uh, for joining today at KidneyCon. We're very excited to start our urine sediment microscopy uh, virtual workshop. We're hoping that technology helps us today, and we have an effective delivery of the content. Uh, just to very briefly uh, introduce uh, myself, my name is Juan Carlos Velez, nephrologist at Alternate Health here in New Orleans. Jay will introduce himself. Um, and we're going to try to accomplish today is, is go through a didactics of essentials of urine sediment microscopy. Um, we're going to start, Jay is going to start with a, with a, with a lecture. Um, the lecture is going to uh, include a short video of a present of a uh, example of urine uh, sediment slide preparation. Um, following that, Jay is gonna uh, continue his presentation and share with us a few cases where we'll be able to appreciate his incredible skills to generate uh, high quality images uh, that has gained him the nickname of the Van Gogh of nephrology. Uh, so I'm, I can't wait to see those new images with his uh, brand new um, uh, station, a microscopy station. And at the end, uh, we'll try to, we'll, uh, I'll take uh, the last few minutes to do a live streaming. I have a microscope set I'll hope to project via Zoom here, sort of a live review of a couple of slides, uh, depending on how much time we have at the end. Um, and we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end, hopefully 15, 20 minutes for questions. So with that, I'll pass it on to Jay and uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll start now. <clears throat> Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jay Seltzer. I'm a nephrologist uh, in the community in St. Louis, uh, primarily at Missouri Baptist Medical Center. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here if, if that's good. All right. Are we good? Yeah, looks great. All right. Um, so I have no disclosures, uh, no conflict of interest. We're going to start out by I'll uh, briefly review sample prepara uh, preparation and preservation. Uh, Juan Carlos will present uh, how to collect the sample and prepare slides. Then we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about how to actually use the microscope to your benefit. Um, I feel strongly you really have to have a good grasp of the microscopy part of this in order to obtain clear images to interpret. We'll review the cells, casts, and lipids that you may encounter, and then talk about how to document findings in terms of imaging. We'll go through a few sample cases and then talk about the next steps, including resources to learn more. Uh, at the end, we'll finish up with some more sample cases from Dr. Bellis. Will we get a live view of the microscope? Um, not, not from mine. I, I, my internet connection in the lab was sketchy, and I was worried it wasn't going to work out. So my Juan Carlos cases, has it though. What's that? Juan Carlos does he have a live view? Yes, he does. Um, so sample preparation. Juan Carlos will cover this in a little more detail. Basically, you want to get fresh urine uh, if it's from the foley, using it from the tubing, not from the bag. Make sure you dipstick the urine, making note of the pH, the specific gravity, whether there's protein, blood, or leukocytes. Um, fill a conical bottom tube with urine, centrifuge, anywhere from 1500 to 1800 or a relative centrifugal force of 400 for five to seven minutes. Um, if it's a very concentrated sample with a lot of sediment, I'll probably go for maybe five minutes at a lower rate. If it's very dilute, I'll spin it longer to increase the yield. Uh, pour off the supernatant, leaving only a half to one mil, resuspend it um, using a pipette to transfer the sediment to a glass slide, and then carefully applying a cover slip 
uh, trying not to allow any air bubbles to form. Uh, remembering you want to have a very thin prep on the slide. Um, the stain we'll talk about primarily is the Sternheimer Malbin stain. It's a stabilized version containing crystal violet and saffronin. It's a super vital stain, allows you to look at live cells. It greatly facilitates identifying white blood cells, epithelial cells, and the cast protein matrix. It's very simple to use. After the usual sediment preparation, all you do is add one drop of stain, uh, mix it gently, and allow one to two minutes for stain uptake. Uh, this is just a brief video showing uh, how easy it is to use the stain and then applying a drop to the slide. Um, I tend to use the Kova brand. It seems to provide better coloring, but there are other brands available, including SETI stain. Um, several others, uh, but of the ones I've tried, I like the Cova the best. So one drop in the tube, resuspending it. Um, I'll usually give it about a minute or two to allow stain uptake before uh, putting on the slide. To mix it, just drawing it up and down in the tube like that uh, results in the least damage to any casts. Remember when you put the drop on the slide and apply the cover slip, you want a very, very thin layer. Uh, the thinner, the better, because if you're looking uh, under the microscope, you have a very limited depth of field in a single focal plane, and you only want one plane of items. And here we apply the cover slip by putting one edge down to the slide, tilting it to where the drop meets this corner of the slide, and then lowering the other slide. Uh, that's the best way to prevent air bubbles. If there's an air bubble, the cover slip is on there at an angle, and you don't get very good depth of field. Hello, welcome to the TV Kong workshop on joint setting of microscopy. Dr. Venice uh, Nepal is the ultra health. Thank you for uh, participating. So we're going to do a quick demonstration of uh, method to uh, prostate urine and prepare for microscopy. The volume is coming out very low, Ajay. The only absolute way to do it is the way that I... Thank you. We follow here. Um, uh, there might be some variations depending on, on where you read or who does it. But for the most part, uh, they're just minor deviations from what I want to show today. So first of all, you got to uh, collect a urine specimen. Um, and uh, usually you would ask the nurse at home or the patient uh, himself or herself to provide a urine specimen. Um, and uh, we receive the urine specimen on a urine cup. Um, we try to ask uh, for a clean catch. Uh, sometimes the patients aren't able to, to avoid, and we ask them for a straight uh, in and out catheter uh, to, to collect the urine. Um, sometimes patients are connected to uh, suction and negative pressure, uh, and that type of urine uh, pulls a lot of squiggles of epithelial cells, which is not ideal. So I don't um, try not to use those specimens. Um, but uh, often patients are not uh, able to provide a specimen. They are in the intensive care unit uh, and they have a Foley catheter, or it could be on the floor with a Foley catheter. So we have to always, I have here a, a Foley catheter kit, and you can see here uh, the congenitor where sometimes we see the urine being collected. We try not to collect the urine from uh, this container because a lot of times, has been sitting there for hours where bacterial colonization can make the urine pH a little alkaline and that may affect the stability of the, the integrity of the casks. So we don't try to collect there. So what, what I try to do is collect urine. Uh, this is a full catheter. As you can see here, this is inserted into the patient's bladder and the urine as it comes out of the bladder is gonna come here in the tube. So if you collect urine from the tubing, it's going to be relatively fresh. So that's what we try to do. So we obtain a 10 cc syringe that's available at any, uh, any hospital floor or ICU. And we come to this um, site of the catheter and screw it in. So it's important to come here, apply some force and screw it in and go ahead and aspirate the urine as it comes out you know, about 10 mLs or whatever you can get, and you get the urine. Usually they have a cap tip on the floor and you seal it and take it to, to the lab. It's important uh, to be aware that 
you don't want to be confused with this end. Uh, this is where the, uh, the water is uh, infused to create to put the bubble in, in, uh, in the catheter and secure it. Uh, so believe it or not, uh, I've been cases where uh, water was aspirated incorrectly. So it's important to note this is where we collect the urine from. Okay. Um, so once we collect the urine, that's, uh, here is a sample that in this particular case uh, came from pup. So we're gonna transfer this urine to a tube. This is a, a 15 ml tube available, a Falcon tube in the lab. The first thing we do is we label. So in this case, we're gonna call it uh, patient X. If the tube is labeled and we're gonna transfer the urine specimen to the tube. When we do that, there's no secret there, it's gently Transfer it. In this case, um, it's a little bit more than 10 ml. So let's say we have 10 ml, that's enough. Uh, you could do less or more than 10, but because we try to do it standardized, we have here the 10 ml of urine. Um, and this is going to go into the centrifuge. We have a 10 ml balance here, and it's going to go right across. Um, and we're gonna seal it and go ahead and centrifuge this uh, for two to five minutes at a 1500 G force. Okay, so once uh, you uh, place the tube in a centrifuge, you have three to five minutes of waiting time. So this is a good time to label your slides. Um, it's important to do that. So you don't want to prepare a slide that is not labeled. If you are inspecting more than one specimen, you get confused, you don't know what patient are you uh, uh, evaluating? And that is obviously a, a, a problem. So this is what I'm going to label this again, patient X. I'm going to prepare two separate slides in this particular case. And um, we're going to get ready. So here is the tube. We've already completed the uh, centrifugation process. The first thing we do is look at the pellet. And now you can see in this tube is a very, very large pellet, very sizable. I would say this is a larger pellet than the average. We're not lucky to get these pellets every day, every <laughs> patient. But uh, it's obviously a good pellet for inspection. So the next step is going to be to remove the supernate, the urine that is uh, uh, the supernating part of the urine. Now. Um, this is something that standard laboratories would, would leave either one ml or half ml, sort of a standard protocol for every patient because they have to quantify red cells, wet cells, their hypophilus, et cetera. So they need to follow a systematic protocol. However, because we do it for direct clinical care, we, we are looking for answers such as yes and no questions about presence of protocols. We try to get the best possible palate. So for that reason, what I would typically do is get rid of as much supernatant as I can. In this case, the pellet is so large that I may not do that. So what I would do normally is I would do this vertically, let the urine drop completely. And I typically would keep the tube dripping. And once you flip it, there's enough urine that sticks to the tube by superficial tension. But in this case, I didn't let it drip because the pellet was so large that it's probably good that we leave some supernatant so we can resuspend. It's already resuspended. This is a very uh, large, milky, dark uh, uh, urine pellet that we're ready for plating. Stop. Okay, so we're getting ready to prepare the slides. So here is a pipette that it should be available in any lab. And here is a pellet. So we're going to prepare. Uh, we're going to see here, it's important not to overload the specimen of this slide. So this is a significant uh, a, a material here. You don't want to drop the entire material here. So as you can see, you squeeze gently and let one small drop. That is enough. I'm not going to put all this urine. Placing an excessive amount of urine is going to create a very thick layer which is going to be actually uh, more difficult to identify identify individual structure. So you don't want to you want to have a very thin film of, of urine specimen 
color uh, on to, uh, in, oh, place on the slide. So once you have that, I'm gonna bring now a cover slip and there are different ways to put the cover slip. Uh, I'm gonna show you one of the methods. You want to try to avoid air bubbles. Um, so one of the methods is to take about a 45 degree angle, let the specimen touch and you see how the urine starts to spread along the edge of the cover slip and let you just let it fall after that. As you can see there, the urine spread out evenly. There is a little bit of a bubble, but for the most part, it's a fairly nice even distribution of the urine specimen on this side. So we're gonna let that sit there. Now, the second slide is gonna be the slide where we're gonna be uh, treating the specimen with this Starnheimer molding or SN stain or SETI stain, COVA stain, uh, et cetera. And we're going to um, take, this is the uh, particular product I'm gonna use uh, for today's demonstration of the COVA stain. And we're going to place one drop of this stain into the specimen. Now, in this particular case, the specimen is, is, uh, is, is, is large enough that I'm not that concerned of oversaturating the sample with the stain. But in general, it's important not to put too much stain that would overwhelm uh, and would create uh, artifacts. So uh, the technique that I try to use is incline the tube at about 45 degrees, start to press the bottle so that the drop comes out and touches the wall of the tube and comes down gradually all the way down. So um, this is usually enough to stain a sample. As you can see here, it takes a few seconds, but once it comes out, all this urine is gonna start to turn the pellet a violet as expected. And in this particular case, it's not as dramatic because this is a large pellet. Another example, this is not obviously a urine, the, a pellet that we're gonna use um, for our patient care today. So you could do another example where you drop another urine, a sample like that, and you can see how it drips. So that's kind of the technique that I follow. I try not to place a, a full drop straight into the pellet because typically that's been end up being too much of the stain. So we're going to take a separate pellet, uh, pipette now and place. Uh, for this, I typically do a pipetting one and two and three up and down very gently just to mix the stain very well with the pellet. You typically want to leave it for a few 30 seconds, maybe two minutes if you have the time. And then you're going to place a second drop. Uh, again, try not to do a very large uh, drop. You could place both drops into the same slide and prepare everything on one slide. I like to do it this way, uh, but both ways are valid. And then we're gonna put the cover slip and I'm gonna do a different technique, which is the different technique is essentially just to let, uh, let it drop without touching it. And you can see um, it works well as well. Sometimes you get a bubble in the middle. This is why I prefer the first method. But these two slides are now ready for uh, inspection under the microscope. Okay, so we're ready for the final step, which is actually inspecting the euro specimen that we just prepared. This is a slide uh, just to share what we find in this particular specimen. So the first thing I like to do is to look at the, uh, the urine sediment with my eyes in the microscope. So I will be looking at the urine here, trying to see what type of findings we can identify. And this urine is filled with a muddy brown granular cast, which is not entirely surprising based on the size of the pellet that we found uh, in the beginning. So we're gonna take this line now. We can also show you in this particular station that is a microscope connected to an iPhone. So we can also see uh, here under bright field microscopy, as you can see there, this uh, slide full of muddy brown granular cast reflective of acute tumor injury. 
And uh, this is just like rifle microscopy. And Dr. Seltzer will be explaining the next steps related to the image acquisition. Okay, the last part is to give credit to our cameraman, Akhang Shramanan, our hey, how's it going? Uh, incoming internal medicine resident here at Auctioner and your microscopist in training. Thanks, Akhang, for your work. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a cool, quick overview of how to prepare your urine sample for uh, uh, microscopy. Um, thank you for your participation. And feel free to uh, contact, contact us uh, via Twitter, uh, follow us on uh, uh, hashtag urinary sediment, hashtag peace profit. All right, uh, very good. So we'll move on by talking about preservation of slides. A lot of times you'll have a sample that's good. You may wanna save it to, to show other people. Um, if you leave it out, it'll just dry up and be worthless, but there are some ways to save them. Uh, methods to prevent or delay desiccation would be to put the slide propped up on something in a covered Petri dish to maintain humidity. Um, a very effective means is using clear nail polish and coating the edges of the cover slip to make it airtight or leaving the pellet in an enclosed test tube and it can stay viable for later viewing for several days uh, without that much degradation of the cells or casts. You can preserve the cells and cast structures by fixing them in a 10% formalin solution uh, usually a one-to-one -one mixture uh, fixing for about uh, 12 hours or so. Um, that's very effective for fixation of the cells. Um, one way to preserve the slides long-term is to mount them using caro syrup. I found this very surprising, but it's remarkably effective. Um, slides fixed uh, and then mounted using caro syrup can last for decades. Um, the only downside is uh, you have to fix the cells first or the osmotic shock of going into corn syrup changes their shape, but the casts and crystals actually uh, stay uh, pretty similar morphology, even without fixation. So let's talk about the microscope now. Um, this is an example of an Olympus uh, upright microscope. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to point out. Um, that we'll be talking about quite a bit. Um, number one is the condenser focus knob that moves the condenser up and down. The field diaphragm um, is the iris diaphragm covering the light source at the base. There is a condenser aperture diaphragm or iris diaphragm under the condenser. Um, and then the stage focus. So it's very important to understand the difference between the field diaphragm and the aperture diaphragm or condenser diaphragm. The field diaphragm controls the area or circle of light that illuminates the specimen. The aperture diaphragm controls the angular aperture of the cone of light through the condenser. Um, the field diaphragm is used to illuminate only the area of the specimen that you're viewing. If you have too much light covering the part of the slide you're not viewing, you'll get glare and distortion and degrade the over, overall image quality. The condenser diaphragm by narrowing the cone greatly increases the contrast, but it occurs at the expense of resolution, which we'll talk about a little bit more. The, I'm sorry. I gotta go back here, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, the objective lenses are labeled and it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with the coding here. Um, the magnification is listed, the numerical aperture of the lens, which we'll talk about in a minute, whether there's any immersion medium used, whether it's oil or water. Um, the plan refers to planar correction, um, so that uh, makes the viewed image flat. It accounts for the curvature of the lens. 
and the chromatic aberration correction is listed here, uh, whether it's achromatic, apochromatic, or fluoride. Um, the different colored bands uh, signify the magnification factor in the immersion medium. And then listed here is the cover slip thickness. It's good to note that because different objective lenses are designed for different thickness cover slips. And if you use the wrong thickness cover slip, you will degrade the overall image. The concept of numerical aperture is important. A higher numerical aperture results in higher resolution of the image. When you have light passing through the slide, through the specimen and the cover glass, it changes from uh, one medium to another here from glass to air. And when that happens, the light is refracted or reflected. And in doing so, you're losing a lot of the data, a lot of the image coming from the specimen is never gathered by the lens. In that case, using an immersion oil in this case, which is used for higher numerical aperture lenses, creates an optical density very similar to the cover glass so that the rays of light pass directly through without being refracted or reflected and you gather far more of the data resulting in a higher resolution image. The concept of cooler illumination is important. Um, we have to make sure that we align the optics of the microscope in a way that provides even illumination across the field of view thus optimizing the contrast and resolution and minimizing artifacts. What that means is adjusting the condenser and the field diaphragm so that only light going through the specimen uh, covers the field of view of the objective with no extraneous light hitting other parts of the slide that aren't in the field of view of that objective. Now we'll talk about how to achieve color illumination. It's fairly simple but it's very important because without this, you are losing image quality. So when color illumination is adjusted properly, the condenser projects uniform light through the specimen plane in parallel bundles from every direction. Uh, in other words, even illumination of a defocused light source. The way this is done is first of all, putting the specimen uh, on using the 10 time objective and focusing on the specimen, you then close the field diaphragm, which is the iris diaphragm covering the light source until you see it uh, come into focus. If it's blurred, you use the focus knob of the condenser to raise the condenser up or down until the edges of the field diaphragm come into sharp focus. If it's not centered, you use the centering screws on the condenser to center the light and then you open the field diaphragm only enough to fill the field of view and no more. The condenser aperture diaphragm um, changes the cone of light and in doing so increases the contrast, but in, you can see in this image, as you increase the contrast all the way here, your resolution goes away. Now, as you open the aperture diaphragm again, you see the resolution come back, uh, but less contrast. Um, it's important to use this aperture diaphragm to get rid of stray light uh, that creates refraction from the oblique light rays and glare, um, but you only close it maybe about 10 or 20%, uh, very seldom more than that. So in order to get ideal image quality, you have to of course, make sure the objectives and eyepieces are clean. Very importantly, always use glass slides and cover slips. Don't ever use these plastic multi-chamber slides that most labs have. They use them because it's a fixed quantity in a field for their cell counting, but the slides are made of plastic. There's very little optical quality. The thickness does not uh, match that of the objective lenses and it's overall bad. You want to make sure you're using the right cover slip thickness. Um, in the picture here, number one is the thickness that is 0.17 that matches the objectives on most scopes. You want to make sure every time you change the objective lens, you reestablish color illumination, which we'll go through again and again. 
and then um, trying to use objectives with a higher numerical aperture. You'll notice that the images with the oil immersion lenses are much higher resolution because they have a higher numerical aperture. They capture more image data. So the best images I think uh, come from a stained specimen with bright field illumination. Phase contrast is excellent, providing a good balance of contrast uh, and resolution, but uh, the best is with bright field of the stained specimen. So we're gonna talk now about the illumination modalities, uh, bright field, dark field, phase contrast, and polarized light. Bright field is the simplest uh, technique. Uh, almost all microscopes have this inherently. Here, um, light comes from the light source through the field diaphragm. It's focused by the condenser lens through the specimen and gathered by the objective lens. Uh, and you get an appearance of a dark sample against a bright background, hence the name. The advantage are it's available on all microscopes. It's simple and it generally provides the highest resolution of stained or pigmented samples. The disadvantage is that um, you have to have a stained or naturally pigmented sample. Otherwise you don't get anywhere near enough contrast or resolution. It's very difficult to visualize objects with a low refractive index such as protein cast matrix. In fact, hyaline casts and cast matrix is invisible under bright field unless it's stained. Um, in many cases, you have to use the aperture diaphragm to add contrast and you end up just decreasing resolution. The way you set up bright field is by setting the condenser to BF or zero, or in microscopes that don't have a condenser with a rotating uh, device, uh, sometimes just the um, absence of anything in the light path is bright field. Dark field is quite a bit different. Here you have an opaque disc in the condenser. Um, it blocks the central light going through and allows only the peripheral light uh, from the light source, which is then focused through the specimen, lighting up the specimen, but those uh, light beams pass outside the range of the gathering ability of the objective lens. So the only thing that you are seeing is the illuminated specimen, but none of the direct light. Um, and therefore you get a bright image against a dark background, hence dark field. Um, the advantages are it allows you to visualize objects that are unstained and otherwise transparent. Uh, it facilitates finding lipids and crystals which have a high refractive index and show up very nicely under dark field. Uh, if you have a scope that does not have phase contrast, Dark field is a good way to identify acanthocytes. You can highlight the edges of the red blood cells quite readily. Um, it's less resolution. Um, it's subject to artifact if the sample is thick and not spread thinly. Um, there's less visual information. The way you set this up uh, depends on the objective you're using. For a 10x objective on most scopes, the condenser setting would be pH 3. For the 40X objective, the condenser typically would be set to DF or dark field. Um, you often have to adjust the condenser focus in the field diaphragm to let a little more light in to get the best effect. Here's some examples. On the top left, you see calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals that just light up under dark field. On the bottom left, some calcium oxalate dihydrate as well. Um, on the top row uh, to the right of the crystal is some yeast. Uh, to the right of that is a granular cast with some adherent epithelial cells. And on the far top right is a glitter cell. Um, the bottom right, um, a red blood cell cast. Uh, and in the middle of the bottom row are some acanthocytes where you can see dark field is a good alternative to phase contrast. Uh, here's another view of a typical dark field image. Phase contrast uh, is a bit different. It alters the path of the light using a phase annulus in the condenser and an inverse phase plate in a matching objective. Um, what you may gather here is yes, the microscope has to be specifically set up for phase contrast, meaning your objectives have to be made for phase contrast and you have to have a matching annulus in the condenser. Um, the effect is enhancement of contrast along object edges and elements with a low refractive index, such as highland protein matrix. Um, for this, you set the condenser to whatever 
the objective says. So for the 40x objective, which has printed on it pH2, that's the setting you use the condenser for the matching pH2 phase annulus. Um, for the 10x objective, it would be the pH1. The advantage are it allows you to visualize objects that are unstained or otherwise transparent, provides a very good balance of contrast and resolution. It is best for thin preps and unstained, uncrowded specimens. With staining, um, if they're thick or crowded, you get tremendous artifact and it becomes almost useless. Um, it greatly aids in the identification of acanthocytes. Um, so again, the image is markedly degraded with uh, thicker preps and with staining. Here's some examples of phase contrast. You can see on the top right how it clearly shows the highland matrix around these tubular cells and white cells. Um, you see the acanthocytes on the top row easily identified. Um, and with these glitter cells, uh, the videos, you can clearly see the granules uh, under phase contrast, which are much more difficult under bright field. Polarized light is very helpful in identifying lipids and uh, crystals. Um, a polarizer is placed below the condenser and another, the analyzer is in the optical path above the specimen, usually between the objective and the observation tubes. And when the polarizer is rotated 90 degrees in relation to the analyzer, all polarized light is blocked and the background that you see is dark. But any light passing through anisotropic objects that bend light in more than one direction, such as lipids and crystals, in other words, they're birefringent, allows the light to be refracted in two directions and therefore that refracted light is able to pass through the analyzer, showing you a brightly contrasted object against a very dark background. Here's some examples on the top left. Uh, you see a lipid cast uh, below. Uh, this is with a, a red compensator um, making the Maltese cross pattern colored. Um, on the uh, top right, you see a lipid cast uh, with the typical Maltese cross pattern created by this simple polarization. So lipids characteristically polarize with a Maltese cross, which greatly aids identifying lipids. Sometimes when you see a bunch of lipid droplets floating around or in a cast, it's hard to tell if they're red cells or other structures, but using the polarizer makes it very easy to tell their origin. Artifacts also light up very brightly like the bottom two right pictures here, uh, making artifacts easily to identify. Uh, here's a video showing on the left some lipid droplets as you rotate the polarizer, showing the Maltese, Maltese cross pattern. And the video on the right is showing a group of seemingly just uh, dense muddy brown granular casts. But as you rotate the polarizer, you see hidden within there is a whole bunch of calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals that were otherwise invisible. So the question often comes up, well, which do you use? Bright field, dark field, phase contrast, polarized? And the answer is you try to use all of them. Uh, this is a good example. In the top left, we see here what looks like a bunch of biconcave objects in the field. Can't quite tell exactly what they are. In the top right under dark field, um, they have a high refractive index, which tells you that these are probably not cells. They're either lipids or crystals. On the bottom left, you see now actually these are within a cast, which wasn't apparent on the bright field or dark field. And then in the bottom right, using the polarizer shows us these are crystals. Uh, so it turns out these are calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals within a cast. A good example of using all of the modalities. So now we'll take some time to talk about the elements in the urine sediment. Uh, we'll focus mostly on casts, particularly red cell casts because they have the most clinical significance. Uh, we won't spend much time on crystals. Uh, that's a talk in and of itself. Epithelial cells uh, vary in appearance depending upon their site of origin, but on the left you see a very high magnification view of some of them fixed on the side of a granular cast. Uh, the video in the middle just shows you the two epithelial cells and their relation to a red cell and uh, two different white cells in terms of size. Neutrophils uh, may occur as a result of infection or inflammation anywhere in the urinary tract. 
They're identified by the presence of granular cytoplasm in the segmented multi multi-lobe nucleus. The sternheimer malbin stain greatly aids in identification of the segmented nucleus, but there are two different staining patterns that are worth talking about. Dark staining neutrophils uh, have translucent or granular cytoplasm and very avid magenta or red staining of the segmented nucleus. These cells are older and no longer viable and readily take up stain. The pale staining neutrophils are very pale with indistinct blue staining of the cytoplasm and nucleus, and they often have visible cytoplasmic granular movement in hypotonic urine. These cells are young and remain viable. Glitter cells are these viable white blood cells that are typically pale staining, and the granular motility is visible when there's low viscosity of the cytoplasm as occurs in the presence of hypotonic urine. Um, they may be called glitter cells. They were originally described by Sternheimer and Malbin and were called Sternheimer Malbin cells or just granular motility cells. They were once thought to be pathognomonic for pyelonephritis, but they're actually a nonspecific finding. Uh, this is how they appear in bright field on the top, phase contrast in the middle, and in dark field in the bottom video. All right. Uh, Glomerular hematuria is very important. One of the main reasons you look at the urine sediment, especially in cases of microscopic hematuria, is to try to find out if you're dealing with a glomerular source of hematuria or a non-glomerular source. So remember, uh, when red cells go through uh, damaged glomerular membrane, um, these RBC membranes get disrupted um, when they pass through the basement membrane. And osmotic and physical forces in the tubules result in an alteration of their shape with a dysmorphic appearance. And you typically will get cytoplasmic blebs uh, that come out. Uh, in this uh, original description, uh, there's a good example of isomorphic variants on the top two rows, bright field and phase contrast, and then dysmorphic variants on the bottom two rows. But the ones were really going to focus on are the acanthocytes. These are the cells that have cytoplasmic protrusions or blebs, kind of Mickey Mouse looking cells. These are the important ones and they've been shown to be the best predictor of a glomerular source compared to all other dysmorphic forms. In fact, finding greater than 5% of red blood cells being acanthocytes provides greater than 95% specificity for a glomerular source. Here we see several examples of acanthocytes Here's some videos giving you a more close-up view of uh, the typical appearance, uh, bright field on the left and dark field on the right. Uh, you can see here again on dark field, if you don't have phase contrast, that's a, a good substitute. And here's a good view of a whole bunch of different dysmorphic forms under phase contrast. I'm gonna let some of these just float by and uh, take a look. Um, Remembering it's the acanthocytes with the cytoplasmic protrusions, whether they're Mickey Mouse or if they've got 10 protrusions or sometimes the blebs will be on the interior. Lots of different dysmorphic red cells and acanthocytes here. Interestingly, the dysmorphic cells typically appeared black under phase contrast because of a lower volume, whereas the isomorphic red cells appear white under phase contrast, as you can see some of them floating by here. Hyaline casts are the most common type of cast. They're basically just solidified TAM horse fall mucoprotein. They're generally seen in states of low urine flow or concentrated urine. Uh, they're generally of no significance. Uh, they are a normal finding, usually accentuated in low urine flow rates, volume depletion, dehydration, or after vigorous exercise. Pigmented casts um, help uh, really get a better view under bright field. They're formed by the adhesion of metabolic breakdown products or drug pigments. Uh, they're named according to their discoloration. Uh, hemoglobin cast uh, is in the upper right where hemoglobin either from degradation of red cells within the cast or hemolytic anemia from heme free hemoglobin. Um, myoglobin on the bottom right, um, bilirubin on the bottom left. Um, and in the uh, top left, uh, drugs like rifampin or phenazopyridine can give you this type of color. In the middle of the bottom, these so-called muddy brown granular casts or dense granular casts, 
It's not clear what the pigment is. It may be lipofusion or several breakdown products from tubular degeneration. Granular casts are the result of breakdown of cellular casts or degenerative products of tubular cells and proteins. Um, they can either be called fine or coarse granular casts, but the distinction has no real significance. They can be seen under normal circumstances, but generally when seen in large amounts, especially the dense granular cast, the muddy brown granular cast, when they're seen in large numbers or in the presence of free tubular epithelial cells are very suggestive of acute tubular injury or ATN. Waxy casts are thought to be a chronic finding or the end product of cast evolution. Um, these generally form with low urine flow rate of obstructive casts. There's dilation of the tubules and stasis and the uh, degenerating materials form this waxy higher refractive index, which looks more rigid. You've got some sharp edges and fracturing. Um, they're often called broad casts, uh, somewhat nonspecific, although we're not really sure what they are made of and what they mean still. So, RBC casts uh, probably of the most clinical significance in terms of findings you're looking for. They generally signify the presence of a proliferative GN or a vasculitic process. RBCs can enter the tubular lumen either via damaged glomerular capillary membranes or damaged tubular basement membranes. Um, they have a variable appearance. Uh, some of them contain only a few cells. Others are so dense you can't even see the protein matrix. It's worth pointing out some of these casts are so dense that you see them under low power as indistinguishable from granular casts. And it's not until you really jump to higher magnification that you can find them. They are sometimes quite elusive. Um, when they initially form, uh, these red cells retain their shape and hemoglobin content, but as they degenerate, they change considerably. The red cells become depigmented um, they can look like ghost cells where you see the cell outline or the cell membrane remnants. Um, the cytoplasm and pigment are, may no longer be visible. Um, further degeneration, including hemoglobin degeneration, forms these Heinz bodies, which are dense granules along the cytoplasmic membrane. The heme released in this process pigments the cast to a yellowish brown color. And at this stage, at the end of degeneration, when the cast is pigmented but without obvious cellular remnants, you can then term it a hemoglobin cast. Here's some examples of red blood cell casts under bright field. These are unstained. Um, on the top left, you see some embedded tubular epithelial cells to give you a size reference. Um, because these tend to be a little bit pigmented, they do show up nicely under bright field. Um, several examples here. Under phase contrast, you can clearly see the outline of these red blood cells. Uh, sometimes it almost looks like snake skin from a distance. Um, when they're th uh, thin, it's very easy to see. Sometimes when you've got dense uh, red cells under phase contrast, you get a lot of artifact of halos around the cells that make it a little less obvious. The highest resolution images, I think, are with stained specimens under bright field, as you see here. Um, you can see uh, very dense red cells packed in here, a lot of different examples here. As they degenerate, you see the um, pigmentation gets a little bit less. You start to see the cells deform, become compressed. Sometimes all you see are the cell membrane remnants. And then later on, you start to see these Heinz bodies or the denaturing of the hemoglobin forming these dense granules along the cell membrane. Uh, in the picture on the left, you see a good example of the difference between viable red blood cells within a cast and the degenerating appearance. Um, here, the kind of evolution of a red cell cast into a hemoglobin cast, where you see on the left the visible red blood cells, but the appearance of some pigmented granular material already starting. And then on the right, you can barely see any remnants of the red cells, and you would uh, term this more of a hemoglobin cast. Um, these tend to be elusive, and it's not until you look under brighter power that you can see that they're red cells. These casts here in these pictures look like dense granular casts under low power. Um, very advanced degeneration here. White blood cell casts are indicative of inflammation and infection. Um, they are usually present in pyelonephritis and interstitial nephritis, but the most common situation I see them is in acute proliferative glomerulonephritis. 
Um, it's very important with white cells in particular to, before you call it a white cell cast, make sure you can clearly visible, see visible cast protein matrix. White cells are notorious for clumping together along uh, linear currents or mucus threads and very commonly form pseudocasts. Uh, so before you call it a white cell cast, make sure you see protein matrix as you can see in these examples. Here we see dark staining and the light staining viable white cells in the same casts. Tubular epithelial cell casts, as the name implies, are tubular epithelial cells embedded within the protein cast matrix. They're very indicative of acute tubular injury or ATN. Um, very commonly, you'll see mixed cellular casts with red cells, white cells, tubular cells, all within the same cast. Uh, sometimes it requires focusing up and down to see the different cells within the cast. These are just several examples. Um, lipiduria occurs uh, also through a damaged uh, glomerular membrane. Lipids uh, can make their way into the urinary space and these lipid droplets then get absorbed by renal tubular epithelial cells. They coalesce into lysosomes and then cytoplasmic droplets. Um, when these tubular cells get burdened with too many of these uh, lipid inclusions, they tend to slough off and pass into the urine as what are called <clears throat> oval fat bodies. So lipids in the urine can occur either as free lipid droplets uh, that make it past the tubular cells or are released into the urine as tubular epithelial cells or oval fat bodies degenerate. Um, we see on the left um, uh, and then on the right polarized, Lipid droplets are always different sizes. That's one way to differentiate them from cells. Um, they also have kind of a yellowish or greenish or orangish uh, hue, even under plain bright field. Cholesterol crystals are rare. Um, I've not seen them very often. Um, I think they're more common in refrigerated specimens, uh, but they're very unusual. They have very angular layer plate-like crystals uh, best seen under phase contrast as seen here with a bunch of red cells in the background. Oval fat bodies uh, are tubular cells. Um, these are completely engorged with lipids and you see the typical Maltese cross pattern under polarized, right, uh, polarized light on the right photo. And then lipid casts. Um, remember lipid droplets in a cast can look like a red cell cast, but the clue that they're lipids is the droplets are different sizes. And of course, if you have polarized light, you'll see the Maltese cross. If you don't have polarization, use dark field. Uh, lipid droplets light up under dark field, red cells do not. Here's some examples of oval fat bodies, um, both free and within casts. Uh, the middle pictures are stained with a Sudan stain uh, that stains lipids in orange color. Uh, here are some examples of lipid casts uh, with their polarized counterpart adjacent. Again, uh, notice the Maltese cross pattern. Pseudocasts, uh, beware of these. These are fairly common. Um, they're cylindrical appearing structures that look like a cast, but the tip off is that there's no visible protein matrix surrounding these cells. They're often an artifact of centrifugation or the movement of cells and debris during cover slip application. Sometimes a stain will actually um, aggregate amorphous debris into linear patterns uh, as the urine flows after cover slip application. Um, just beware of these. Um, crystals we're not gonna talk a lot about, but uh, the ones to look for um, are calcium oxalate. Um, you can see in the top uh, middle and top right, the dihydrate crystals on the um, Middle and rod, uh, middle right and the bottom right, calcium oxalate monohydrate. Um, the colorful ones in the middle bottom are uric acid. The bottom left is leucine, and to the right of that, bilirubin crystals. Of course, you can see drug crystals, uh, but this is a topic all of its own. We won't have time to go over today. So, very briefly, urinary patterns in renal disease, um, hematuria in particular in association with acanthus, cyturia, RBC cast and proteinuria is very suggestive of glomerulonephritis or an acute vasculitis. Heavy proteinuria and lipiduria, usually non-proliferative glomerulopathies, focal sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, minimal change, diabetes, amyloid. Granular casts with tubular epithelial cells, especially renal tubular epithelial cell casts are indicative of acute tubular injury or necrosis. 
White blood cell casts, um, I think, predominantly proliferative glomerulonephritis, although traditionally they're thought of as indicative of interstitial nephritis and pyelonephritis. And then of course, a normal sediment, which is often disappointing when you go to the trouble of doing all this and you don't see anything in the setting of AKI usually points you more towards a pre-renal, vascular or obstructive etiology of the AKI. So how do you document your images? Um, if you have a smartphone, there are various adapters available. These are just two. Um, the lab cam is a very easy to use device. It's very reliable. The only downside that I found is that it is only um, built to allow you to use the regular lens of the iPhone. It won't let you use the telephoto lens, which has higher resolution. Um, the other uh, platform, the MI platform, I've used this. It allows you to position your device any way to use whichever lens you want, although it's not quite as easy. There are lots of other adapters on the market. I just haven't used them, but if you have a smartphone, uh, look into them, try them. They're not very expensive. Uh, digital SLR, this is what I just recently moved uh, to using. It allows you to use an SLR um, if you have a head for the microscope with a third tube. It just requires an adapter and then a cable connect to a monitor. Um, you get higher resolution, uh, easier to capture images and videos without having to put your phone on, take it off, et cetera. And then a lot of the uh, makers have a CCD device or a CMOS imaging device. These are very good, but for some reason, they're extremely expensive, several thousand dollars um, for lower resolution than you can get a $500 digital SLR for. Remember though, when you are capturing images, you wanna make sure at the time of capture, you get the highest resolution image. So beware of increasing contrast with the condenser aperture diaphragm. This creates uh, more contrast, but it decreases the resolution. Remember, you can always increase contrast later during post-processing. So typical workflow, um, sample collection, slide preparation, remember to label tubes and slides. Um, color illumination is crucial. You wanna focus on the image first, then adjust the field diaphragm. You do this every time you change objective lenses. Again, you're making sure there's no stray light hitting parts of the slide you're not viewing and creating glare and degrading the image. Um, scan the slide for elements of interest. You can use bright field, phase contrast, or dark field for scanning. I use all of these at different times. Use the higher power objectives, including oil. Um, if you have them available, you'll get higher resolution and be able to see finer details. Remember to focus up and down, as you see in the video here, because there's sometimes things hidden in different focal planes that may not be obvious. Um, in this video, you see some white blood cells uh, in here also. It's not just a red blood cell cast, but they're white blood cells that become obvious as you focus up and down. Um, document your findings. Uh, remember to clean the oil off of the oil objectives after every session, otherwise they will be damaged. And always clean up your area, dispose of slides and samples before you're leaving the lab. Uh, a couple of sample cases here. First, look under the 10 max objective and focus. Right field map, which the condenser is set to zero. Now we set our color illumination, which means we'll first close the field diaphragm. Can you turn it up a little bit, Jay. Focus the condenser until we get a nice crisp outline of the iris diaphragm edges. Still hard to hear. Field diaphragm again until the light goes. The view there. And you can see at a glance now that there seems to be some cast there. So we'll go up to the 40 year subjective, still on right here. Maybe can, can you narrate over it? Just tell us what's happening. 
Are you having trouble hearing that? Yeah, we couldn't hear it. Okay. Um, let me. Uh... But Jay, you can play the video and put a mute, and you can just do the narrative. All right. Let me. Uh, let me do that. The images are good. It's just the audio. Okay. Let me just uh, change the volume of those. All right. Let's try this again. All right, you guys can hear me okay? Yes, we hear you. All right, so we've got a patient here that comes in with uh, acute renal failure. Uh, we've got the slide mounted. Uh, we have the 10 of, 10x objective set up. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is to focus on the specimen, uh, the 10x objective under Brightfield, which is the condenser setting. And this is zero. stain too, right? Yeah, this is with the Sternheimer Malvin stain. So now we want to set up the cooler illumination. We'll close the field diaphragm. And then we'll adjust the condenser uh, by focusing up to make sure that the outline of the field iris diaphragm comes into sharp focus. Then if it's centered, which it is here, we'll open up the field diaphragm, filling just the field of view with light. Uh, thereby avoiding any stray light on the slide that would cause glare. So we can see at a glance here, there are some casts. Um, we're gonna go up to the 40X objective to get a closer view. The first thing we'll do is focus again. And then after the specimen is focused, we'll readjust the field diaphragm to limit the light just to the field we're viewing. And you can see here, it looks like there are some red cells in this cast. Um, we're going to try to get a little bit uh, better view here by adjusting the contrast using the aperture diaphragm under the condenser. So we only want to close it a little bit. If you close it too much, you'll lose resolution. So it just adds a little sharpness to the edges. And you can see a little better that those are what look like red cells. Um, next thing we're going to look at it under phase contrast, which is pH two. Um, since this is kind of a thick prep, there's a lot of stuff crowded here. You see a lot of artifact, uh, but notice the red cells in the background. The phase contrast gives you a good look at them. You can see some of those are acanthocytes. As we focus on the cast though, because it's thick, uh, the phase contrast is not as useful here. Now we'll get a look at it under dark field, which is DF on the condenser for this objective. We have to open the field diaphragm to let a little more, bit more light in. We get a really cool otherworldly effect here. Um, sometimes it's helpful for identifying things, especially with a high refractive index like lipids or crystals. Here we can see the outline of the red cells a little bit, but again, because it's very dense, um, you don't get a, kind of the best high resolution image. So we'll go back to Brightfield. Um, we'll set things up uh, again. And in just a minute, I think we're gonna get a closer up view with, uh, with the oil objective. All right, so here we're going to switch to the oil immersion lens. So we'll get our oil immersion dropper ready. Uh, we'll Makes me nervous to do oil immersion in a group microscope setting. Uh, wait, say that again, Matt? In a group microscope setting with multiple people using it. Um, there's usually, most labs will have a- uh, Just gets oil all over the place sometimes if you're not oh, careful. Yeah. Everyone has to make sure to clean it up afterwards or it's a mess. Uh, so one drop over the field and you move the oil immersion lens on there. And now we see a much finer view of the cast. We will, because we change objectives, close the field diaphragm, make sure that the lighting is set up correctly. And we'll open up the aperture diaphragm or the condenser iris diaphragm to get more resolution. And now you can clearly see those are red cells in that cast. Um, otherwise, it would be a little bit hard to identify. It's 
incredible. All right. Now, this is a different uh, patient. Uh, this one was from actually this morning. Um, this is a patient that came in with hematuria and proteinuria um, and AKI. So we've got it under bright field. It's a stained specimen. Oh, no, sorry. It's under phase contrast. A uh, stained specimen on the 10x objective. We're setting up the color illumination, closing the field diaphragm, opening it. Now we're going up to the 40x to see what it is. And it looks like uh, red cells and some other cells. Um, so we've got the lighting set up. Um, we're going to focus up and down and we can see those look like some white blood cells, the segmented nuclei, maybe a couple epithelial cells, but mostly red cells there. Uh, but we're gonna need to get a little closer up view of this to make sure. So we're gonna switch to the oil immersion lens. Um, again, this is the 100X objective we're switching to. And I think uh, when I switched it, it moved the cast just a little bit. And I had trouble finding it. Um, there it is, but I didn't realize it. Now we're going to go back and there it is. Now we'll focus. Uh, we'll readjust the lighting. Again, with every objective change, you want to close the field diaphragm, make sure it's in focus. Um, you see all the detail you get here. Um, there now, once we get the lighting right, you'll see a uh, get really crisp view of this cast. Um, and we'll focus up and down a little bit. And you can see the different red cells in here, the segmented nuclei and the stained white cells. And uh, there's probably a tubular cell in there too. So That's incredible. Very good view of this cast. Do you even use no stain? Um, yeah, a lot, I, a lot of times uh, I'll do it without stain. In fact, I think the next one is an unstained specimen. Okay. Um, I try to use the stain and unstained on every case. Um, there's certain things that are easier to see without stains under phase contrast. Um, so here, this is uh, the same case, uh, the urine unstained under phase contrast. And obviously that looks like... Uh, from a distance, probably a red cell cast. We're gonna go up to the 40X objective, uh, go to bright field now and focus. And yep, you can see the outline of the red blood cells there. Uh, adjust the lighting, center it, make sure it's in focus and then open it just to fill the field. Now we're gonna close down the aperture diaphragm to add some contrast. You'll see how it becomes a little bit more crisp here. And focusing up and down, and we see that um, definitely a red blood cell cast. There may be some other cells in there, but we probably need a closer look. So once again, oh, here we're going to look under phase contrast and see what it looks like. Um, you can see the outline of the red cells very clearly, um, but since it's uh, multi-layered or thick, you get a lot of artifact from the overlapping halos around the red cells. Uh, when you darken, uh, I change the camera lighting to darken it, uh, you get a little better view here. It's definitely worth the uh, free price of admission. <laughs> now we're going to we're going to try dark field, um, and this is pretty cool. You get a really good view of this under dark field, um, the outline of the red blood cells. And again, if I were to focus on the cells in the background um, instead of the cast, it's a good substitute for phase contrast. You can clearly see the outline of these red cells floating by. Um, if there are acanthocytes, you'd be able to see it. Now, you look at some of these red cells and they have a little bit of bleb on them. Is that, yeah. am I, is that real or is that? Yeah, it's real. I, in this case, Interestingly, it didn't have a lot of frank distorted cells, but there were some with small cytoplasmic blebs on them. There's the ongoing debate about why there's no dysmorphic RBCs actually in the cast. Yep, yeah, uh, my best answer for that is that I think um, it's a two hit phenomenon where the cell membrane gets damaged passing through the damaged glomerulus 
and the osmotic forces through the tubules allow the cytoplasm to protrude. But when these cells end up in a cast being compressed by solidified protein matrix, it squeezes the cytoplasm back in and reshapes the cells. That's purely speculative, but I can't think of any other way to explain it. So here we're under oil. Again, we're focusing up and down and you can see that there are white cells here. You see the segmented nuclei, the white cell at the bottom left. And as we focus a little bit deeper, you'll see a couple white cells there um, with the segmented nuclei. So a mixed cellular cast, not just red cells, uh, but you get a very, very good detailed view of this cast under the oil immersion lens focusing up and down. All right, so next steps, um, start looking at urine. Um, for those uh, who have access to a hospital lab, they're often very friendly. If you don't have your own microscope, if there's not a microscope in the renal division or on the floor, talk to the hospital lab. They may welcome you down there, let you use their equipment. Um, it is important uh, to follow the rules and ideally obtain CLIA certification for provider performed microscopy at your lab or in your office or in your clinic. Um, learn how to use the microscope effectively. Urine microscopy is not just um, getting a urine sample and looking at it. You really have to know how to use the microscope, adjust the illumination to get clear images so you can tell what you're looking at. Um, we've, we've all seen some of these photos and old texts that um, you can't really tell what's there. Um, it's because they're, they're, they're not set up properly for imaging. Uh, and then definitely take time to look at any cases of acute GN or vasculitis that come in. These are a gold mine of abnormal findings, and this is your best way to get familiarity with searching for a red cell cast, white cell cast, and dysmorphic red cells. Uh, the provider perform microscopy is actually fairly simple to get certified for. Um, there's a document here by the CDC online. It explains everything. Um, the application is fairly simple. Um, if you're getting this through your uh, lab, uh, they can get accredited for you. It basically makes it so that you have to take a, a, a test demonstrating that you know what you're doing in order to use the equipment. And someone has to log what cases are looked at, uh, whether the stains are expired or not. Um, things like that. So easy to do. And, and just to clarify, the, the number, the, it's like three or four questions each time you do it. It's yes, pretty yes. easy. Yeah. Um, and before I turn it back over to Juan Carlos, I uh, just want to go over a few resources that I think everyone will find helpful. There aren't a lot of textbooks that cover this information. The two best ones that I've found are the Color Atlas of Urinary Sediment. It's by the College of American Pathologists. It's an excellent very thorough coverage. Um, the classic, the urinary sediment and integrated view by Giovanni Fogazzi is still well worth reading. Um, there are some excellent YouTube videos, especially the bottom one, this micro course, Microscope Alignment for Optimal Image Quality. It explains color illumination better than I can. It's extremely well done and well worth watching. And then iBiology.org has some excellent microscopy videos learning how to actually use the microscope. Um, hopefully most of you have found the Renal Fellow Network Urinary Sediment of the Month um, sections helpful. There's a whole bunch of them there now covering almost everything. Um, and then uh, hopefully everyone is on NEF Twitter. Um, the hashtags to look for are hashtag urinary sediment and hashtag urine microscopy. Um, my feed is at JR Seltzer. There's Juan Carlos, uh, Florian Buckreimer, a nephrologist in uh, Switzerland and Germany. Excellent material. And then Jose Tesser Poloni in Brazil, also some excellent material. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Velas. Thank you, Yeri. That was uh, incredible, as usual. Um, so we're going to now um, try to uh, live stream a few cases that I have here. Uh, Jay has put a, a razor bar very high for me to uh, try to impress you. I'm not going to have those amazing RBC casts, but I'll show some things that might be helpful 
when we do your microscopy. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay, can everybody hear me well? Yes. Great, okay. So I'm showing a screen uh, right now where um, I, you may identify a cast uh, close to the middle of the screen. Yes? Okay, so it's a cast, but it's kind of faint. You don't get to see it very clearly. And that is a cast that we can see. I remember that Dr. Selcher was explaining the condenser aperture diaphragm. Actually, if I don't really move that, it will be like this. So you don't really get to see it until you move the aperture, the condenser a little bit. So sometimes that improves the contrast. You can see it well. You lose resolution, but you can see it. But the point is that bright view microscopy, as good as it is, and it's, I agree with Jade, is the best. Sometimes when you scan a sediment slide that doesn't have a lot of findings, you may struggle finding anything. So this is one of the advantages that I would like to add to dark field microscopy. Because in dark field microscopy, you see how it stands out. So when you're scanning a slide, it allows you to very quickly uh, identify uh, a cast and then you can switch back to bright field once you identify it. So you can appreciate there that that uh, cast stood out very, very quickly. And when I go now to 40X, which will be really 400X. And this is a cast uh, that appears for the most part as a hyaline or lightly granular. But if you can see carefully, appear to be a red blood cell here at the edge of the cast that appears to be a little bit dysmorphic. And I can tell you that I had this image about 30 minutes ago when Jay was giving his lecture. And I took a snap image of that cast right here. And this is the same cast uh, 25 minutes ago. And you can see in this cast that you can recognize the RBCs and you can probably more confident calling it an RBC cast or a cast that contains RBCs. However, 25 minutes later, it becomes a little bit more difficult. It's just an example of, of little details that may affect your ability to identify particles. But again, the point of the end, the main point that I wanted to highlight with this was the advantage of dark field. I'm gonna go back to 10X for a second, see if I can show you a little bit of that feel. So if I'm scanning here, I see another quickly, another bright structure. You see the, the cast, they're gonna stand out very quickly. You can lower the light a little bit and you can see that is a cast, but it will take you a, um, a lot less time using dark field to identify those structures. Okay, so that's the first case. Let me take another slide here that um, hopefully we'll see some acanthocytes. Okay, I'm gonna go start at bright field microscopy. Here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Um, were you able to see the changes in dark field? I, I don't, I haven't seen any changes. You haven't seen any changes, okay. Just a, a green square to, in the middle of the field. No, but when I was projecting the dark field images. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, you saw that, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I was just making sure. Okay. I thought you meant, thought you meant it was still on. Sorry no, 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 that. no. Okay. All right. Okay. So I am going to um, go back. I think I need to stop share and share again. No, let's uh, go to save a view. Okay, so now we are starting to see some structures. I am now at 100X, so 10X plus the eyepiece. There's a little structure right there in the middle. It doesn't seem to be very exciting. Um, so I am going to move the aperture a little bit and when I go straight to 40X and see if we can start to identify some structures. That looked exciting to me, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, let's see if we can find something here. I'm gonna go start at perhaps a face contrast. I'm gonna go purpose of time straight, go to face contrast to try to illustrate the benefit of face contrast when it comes to identifying acanthocytes. So now I'm gonna lower the light a little bit and try to get some folks. So I wanna to start to navigate a little bit don't get dizzy, just give me a few seconds. Okay, there you go. Looks like we might find one. There are plenty of acanthocytes. Oh my, <laughs> look at that one. Yes, there's a good one. All right, so there's one acanthocyte right there. I think we all agree that is a nice acanthocyte. It's got a, a hole in the middle. You can see the red blood cell. You can count one, two, and three very prominent blebs and maybe three little tiny antenna. So that is a... <laughs> That is definitely uh, an acanthocyte. Now I'm gonna leave Can that- Can I stop you right there? I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanna yeah. ask one thing. So, you know, the differentiation here is between an acanthocyte and a crenated RBC. How do you know that's not a crenated RBC? Excellent question. So crenated RBCs, uh, first of all, they will not have a hole that appears of a hole in the middle of a donut shape. So you will have the entire RBC and what it has is a sort of a wrinkled edges or spiny edges, um, not this particular blebs that protrude out of a circumference. So, um, you know, if we, we may or may not see an accredited RBC in this particular field, but we're already seeing uh, many, many accounts. So if you go to the other side of the slide here, we may start to appreciate this one right here. I'm gonna to try to focus this one. Looks like a little um, pacifier sign. But going back to your question, uh, Matt, um, it, it's really the morphology is different. I don't know if Jay would like to add anything to what I answer. Yeah, let me uh, see if I can uh, share something real quick. Um, it's really nice. You see like one or two, three in the field right now, and then a couple that are normal. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna uh, and also I think with crenated, I, I usually see it's like it's like all of them look like that, like hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you find something that is every its entire field, I mean, there are some dramatic cases where overwhelming majority RBCs are acanthocytes. Jay has posted some of those videos on Twitter. I've seen cases like that. But you're right when when it's overwhelming, you gotta be careful and not overcall it. But the crenated RBCs are really more a spiny structure that don't have this uh, resemblance of glomerular hematuria. But before I pass it on to you, Jay, I'm gonna finish with this particular finding here. I'm gonna go now switch it to a bright, to dark field uh, to show how dark field can also be very nice to identify a canto size. You can see here, you can nicely see the structure of the RBC and it stands out very, very clearly. Now I'm gonna go back to bright field and this is where it becomes a challenge. We don't really see much. Now you start to see a little bit of the RBC. Of course, if I move the aperture again to give more contrast, it starts to show up, but you could appreciate that going from this image back to the face contrast, it's gonna be a pretty obvious difference and the, red, and the ability to identify in a cancel site. Want me to pass it uh, to you, Jay, for a few minutes? For a couple yeah, just, minutes? just uh, maybe just to show one screenshot. All right, I'll stop sharing. I'll give it back to you and it'll take over again. And why did you not stain that specimen real quick, Juan Carlos? Uh, this specimen was stained. I, I have a stained specimen for this sediment as well, but because I am specifically making a point about acanthocytes, which you don't need to stain to identify acanthocytes, I'm not okay. showing that slide. But I, th this this sediment... But you could, though. I mean... It, you it could, yeah. yeah. The, the sediment... The, the, I'm sorry, the stain is not going to hurt you, may actually help you a little bit to identify acanthocytes, but... Identification of a cancer is not the place where stain is critical. Uh, can you see my images here? Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. So this is an oblique illumination, but you see the acanthocyte with the, kind of the hole in the middle, the Mickey Mouse blebs, and the echinocytes just have spikes over the entire surface of the cell membrane. Um, that same as crenated? Is that? Yeah, echinocytes and crenated are synonymous. Got it. Um, here's another image of an echinocyte. You see the spikes coming off the cell membrane as opposed to actual cytoplasmic protrusions. It almost looks like that acanthocyte has a little bit of a crenated appearance as well, like around it, the edges. Yeah, it does on the other side. You're right. I and mean, that, it makes sense, though, if they're in the same environment. like Right. If they're in hypertonic the urine, that would be a, a not uncommon thing. All right, I'm going to turn this back over. OK. All right, we'll go back to the same patient. And I like to see if you already start to identify yet another clear cut acanthocyte. So let me uh, readjust the focus knob. Let me move this green square right here. There you go. So you can see this is not quite the best Mickey Mouse, but definitely a, a, an erythrocyte with two blood protruding in the shape of ears. You can see that very well. Yes. Okay. Let's try. Let's try again. How uh, dark field illumination projects that, and this is where you may have to push the light more, and you can see it now very nicely. Excellent. Okay. Let's go back to face contrast, which is my way to go for acanthocytes. But again, dark field is really good as well. Let's see if we can find one more. And then we'll move on to the next case. Yeah, I am seeing really another one right here. If you may see, let me try to focus for you. Lower the light a little bit to highlight it. Remove the auto exposure. Okay. Can you see that acanthocyte there? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, of course, you could put oil immersion and go to a hundred um, to a thousand X to try to take a closer look. I'm probably going to do that with this one right here. This acanthocyte is not as impressive because it doesn't have multiple blebs, but it's very classic to have this. I call it a pacifier sign. You have one large bleb, and uh, I'm going to go and see and try to look at it under. 100x, which again, you don't really need it, but in case you're looking for more uh, detail. This is when you're trying to get a good picture for Twitter. Just just admit it. Uh, I, I, you're right. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to impress Jay. Uh, <laughs> it's the who can get the best picture. I, I call it a snowman sign uh, instead of a pacifier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see if we can get that that on uh, here, here, right here, okay. So that's the RBC, the RBC. as you can see, um, the, this particular scope doesn't have um, the best resolution at 100X necessarily, but it does the job. So I'm gonna give auto exposure and try to get that, there you go. So that's the RBC there, right there. You can see nicely the blab. You can you can get a good good confirmation that is indeed a um, a canthocyte. Okay, so let's, uh, it, let's. There's a question in the chat about um, how many uh, acanthocytes do you need? I thought Jay didn't you mention five percent number? Yeah, right? greater than five percent of the red cells seen. Uh, predicts greater than 95% that it's glomerular origin. Yes, that's, you know, that's, a, you, you got to go back to the, to the, uh, to the paper uh, from Kohler uh, in 91, where he used that um, threshold to call it a canthocyturia. But it's, it's kind of arbitrary. Uh, we don't really know if 5, 10, 15, 20% um, 
you know, I think if you find a, a few in this line, I, I personally don't count the percentage. It's about finding a few, which could be only a handful, uh, if uh, if they're very clearly uh, clear cut acanthocytes with multiple blebs, you know, I, I'm going to use that information uh, 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 in a patient. I guess it, I guess the point would be. If you search the entire field, like many different places, you find one, then maybe you're sort of stretching it. But if yes. you're finding them a few in every field you go to, then yeah. now you're getting there. Yeah, that's a good point. And Jada and I talked about this, uh, that, you know, if you find only one, it's usually not a convincing one. So when you find ones that are clear, in my experience, I never find just two or three. I find more than that. I know what Jay, uh, what is your experience? I take the same approach. I, the way I look at it is if you see acanthocytes, it leads me on a search for red cell casts because all you need to see is one red cell cast to clinch the glomerular origin. Um, if you see a few acanthocytes, you have a fair idea that's what it is. But um, if I don't see any acanthocytes, I don't spend as much time searching for those elusive red cell casts. Um, but you're right. If you see a few, that's significant. I don't take the time to count them and see if I'm greater than 5%. All I need to see is a few to know what I'm dealing with. Great. Okay. So this is a, a sediment of a patient with cirrhosis and a bilirubin of 28, acute kidney injury, the classic scenario where we're trying to call it HRS, ATN. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to necessarily come up with a diagnosis, but I just want to show you typically <clears throat> You see, you can appreciate in this slide a very yellowish or greenish type of sediment with multiple structures. And one finding that stands out in this particular case are the, those round greenish structures that Jay showed in his crystal slides. This patient had multiple, multiple uh, losing crystals. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit more. I'm going to still on 100x. We'll come out to 400x in a second, but I give it a little bit better contrast right there. And now I'm going to move to use polarized light. And you can see how nicely we're going to find those uh, those losing crystals. Remove the auto exposure icon here, and now you can see those those losing crystals really stand out. Uh, and you start to see here where you see, can you see this little hand on the screen? Yes. Great. So I'm trying to circle this one that appears to have a Maltese cross sign. This is something that is, is uh, as uh, Jay uh, showed us, very classic finding in lipid droplets. But loosened crystals sometimes can polarize also give you the Maltese cross sign. So I'm going to try to go to 40x to better illustrate that. So when I go back to uh, auto exposure, okay, so I'm gonna try to put that crystal close to the center. Okay, let's see if we can try to generate that. There you go. Oh. Can you see it? Perfect. Great, so this is, I'm gonna give a little bit more uh, focus. And that's an example of a losing crystal. This particular patient had numerous losing crystals. Uh, interestingly enough, the clinical significance of losing crystals hasn't re really well studied. There are some case reports and anecdotal reports of patients who undergo kidney biopsy and they may have the tubules clogged with, with, with loosening crystals. But uh, outside of those isolated reports, we don't really know the crystals are just happen to be stuck there or they have any, uh, any kind of a pathogenic effect on the tubuli. But it's important to recognize them so we don't make a wrong identification. So we can probably move, let's see, um, Really, you don't need to see anything else other than polarized light and bright field, but we can try to look under dark field, and that's how they look, and have the loosened crystals as well. 
and everything looks pretty greenish. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think we made a good point with the Lucent Crystal. Let's move to the next case. We're, going, we're doing well on time, 322. Okay. So the next case is... Is, is the bread and butter of AKI consoles in a hospital. I'm gonna start with bright field. And this is a stain. This is especially for Dr. Sparks. This sediment has been treated with Star Harbor Malvenstein. Um, and this is something I would like to share with you. This particular uh, specimen is the same specimen that I utilized with uh, for the video that Dr. Seltzer uh, uh, presented. And I kept this specimen here in the lab uh, for a week. Now, uh, what I would like to show it, uh, mention is that because you may have, you may be a nephrology fellow coming on a weekend and you spin a urine and prepare a slide and you would like your attending to, uh, to look at the slide or have somebody take another look you may leave the pellet in the tube in your bench in the lab at room temperature, and you could still be able to find uh, a decent amount number of structures. So it's a, a, you don't think that you have to keep it in the refrigerator for the next day. Uh, it's not something that I I am advocating. This is just something that you that you may need it might might come handy in certain situations. So. This is a good example of muddy brown cast, but I just want to go straight to the main point about muddy brown granular cast, and essentially for any slide, is that go to the edges. The edges of the cast where the cover slip ends is usually very much clustered with casts that you can find. In this particular case, we don't need to do that because this specimen has had a, a, a copious number of granular casts, but sometimes you have scatter cast and you're trying to find, go to the edges where you're gonna probably have more, uh, more likely to finding cats. And- yeah, I don't think you're gonna have a problem here. Just, yes, um... <laughs> not at all. And, and this, this particular case, the steady stain just makes the cast look very purple and dark, uh, uh, but you know, it wasn't really necessary in this particular case. All right, let me show you. I think you. it's also good to, uh, you know, uh, detect sometimes red cells and um, white cells that are inside the cast. It's a little yes. easier and, they and the nuclei come out a little bit better. But it's interesting for this um, stain here, all you see is cast. I don't see a lot of other cellular elements around it. In this particular case, yeah. In this particular case, which is odd. Usually you at least see something like it is white true. Cells, white yeah, cells, you may see. Something. Typically, you get to see a few tubular epithelial cells floating around the cast. Uh, yeah, but not much in this particular case. Okay. I mean, th there's been a, there's always discussion about muddy brown, coarse granular. Those are synonymous. People just use them in different ways. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think uh, I, coarse granular or muddy brown to me are the same. Um, that and for me as well. It's just. Yeah, how, do you, how colloquial do you want to get with it? Yeah, I think it, to me the distinction is a finely granular cast versus a muddy brown granular cast because a finely granular cast are often found in a patient with chronic kidney disease with proteinuria, uh, and they're typically not super abundant. They are found scattered in the field, whereas muddy brown are darker, typically in clusters. And, uh, and associated with acute tumor injury much more directly. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's just uh, terminology. Okay, let's try to move to the next case. I got I think two more to show, well, actually one more case that I have a stain and unstain. So let's see, one second here. Let's look at this slide. I have this particular case. I have a stain and unstained sample. Hopefully we can appreciate some of the advantages 
um, of the stain here. Okay, so we have we change the auto exposure so we can visualize the slide. You can see some structures. I'm gonna try to get it um, better. Okay. All right, so we have a pretty, um, so far, unimpressive slide. We may see some structures um, and nothing that immediately grabs our attention. Oh, I'm just gonna try now the stain slide. See if we could, um, get a different flavor or not. And this is it. Uh, a stain slide is gonna allow you to visualize hyaline casts, which again, may or may not have clinical significance, but you start to identify at a low power field, things that otherwise could be rather unimpressive without the stain. This is an example of a broadcast kind of waxy that stands out very, very quickly with, um, with the stain. Now, let me go to 40X for the last point that I'm gonna try to make today in this demonstration, which is the phase contrast and hyaline casts or cast matrix. So here it is. I'm gonna give the art exposure again. Okay. So you may see in this field, uh, 400X, um, I'm gonna lower the, the light a little bit. Okay, so you can appreciate this uh, cast matrix very nicely. There's a convoluted one at the bottom. Some of it appears to be maybe a mucus thread, thread but here where, where the mouse is, is clearly a cast. Here there's a clearly a cast. Now let me move on from phase contrast back to bright field. And this is bright field right here. I'm going to readjust the light. And this is bright field. So you don't really see where are those hyaline casts. I'm gonna move the aperture to try to bring more contrast. Hopefully we start to see, we may start to see in them, but again, we're losing resolution here we kind of see the cast. The one on top, you can't really see. So I'm gonna go back now to face contrast one Completely more time. Completely just disappeared. It wow. does, it disappears. Now let me go back to face contrast and voila, oh. it came back. So this is about uh, the point that Jay made earlier about how each technique, bright feel, dark feel, polarized light and face contrast microscopy brings specific advantages and use them all is the, the optimal way to analyze the urine sediment. Can you tell us uh, what the significance of this finding here is in your mind, like when you're piecing this together? Yeah, this particular case, if you have hyaline casts that do not contain any cells, to me, that means tubular stasis. And the tubular stasis could mean a volume depleted state or could, or could be also in a patient with has acute tubular injury they were just not catching the granular cast. So in a context of, of cirrhosis and HRS, for instance, finding highly cast is expected because they are in tubular stasis. So you don't have to have injury. What happens is multiple, many times, like in this case, you have a cast that appears to have a cell. We don't recognize very well the cell, but it could be a tubular epithelial cell or a white cell that is inside a cast. So in that case, uh, it's, it's, it becomes a cellular cast and now you have to start to think in a different way to just tubular stasis. You may be looking at, at an interstitial nephritis and acute tubular injury, a glomerular nephritis. That opens up uh, the differential. But yeah, hyaline cast without any additional particles inside them don't really uh, offer an incredible uh, clinical significance. Okay. There's a question about um, the size of the cast being so big. Is there any significance to that? Does he call it a broadcast, which I've, I mean, it's interesting, broad, 
a broad cast, not a broadcast. Correct. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, bro- this is a broadcast, but that is a broadcast. <laughs> Who are you calling a broad? <laughs> I, I think there was a waxy cast that I call it a broadcast uh, because it's, it's the width is increased. Um, at what you could read in, in books, and again, I haven't really seen any type of data with measurements of cast that they correspond to the areas close to the collecting duct or a collecting system where the, the diameter of the, of the collecting system is larger and those casts are gonna be wider than a portion of the nephron that is a lot narrow. Um, so broadcast usually go along with waxy cast and what they mean is, although the book says those mean chronic kidney disease, it they mean is establish or sustain tubular atrophy. And yes, that is a common finding in CKD, but you could also see it in a severe and prolonged sustained cause of AKI. And we uh, actually presented this as an abstract at Kidney Week a couple of years ago. Hopefully we'll present in a manuscript soon that waxy cast are actually not rare at all in the context of, of ATN and, and AKI. I have one last slide to show before we uh, go back to the Q&A here. I'm gonna uh, ch- change my screen. Uh, give me one second, share screen. This is a slide. Okay, great. So I'm gonna share this slide with you, just a point that uh, Jay and I were wanted to uh, make sure we emphasize at the end is that uh, we really think that we all nephrologists need to do this, not the lab. And there are studies that have already looked at this question. Is the lab good enough to do this? And I'm gonna show you a few examples of that. This is a paper in AJKD 2005. They looked at the 26 patients who had various causes of AKI, ATN and acute glomerular nephritis here. You can see that the nephrology lab identify granular cast 96% of the times compared to 38% of the time of the hospital app and renal tool epithelial cell cast 46% of the times in a nephrology laboratory, zero in the hospital laboratory. Another example, this is out of Turkey, a, con- a concordance analysis of automated ho- laborator- hospital laboratory versus manual uh, by the uh, consultant team of white blood cells and cast yeah, white blood cells lab is pretty good, but look at CAST, a uh, terrible concordance of 0.1, which is uh, it qualify as poor. And here's another, yet another uh, study in uh, much larger, 298 patients, microscopy urinalysis and automated flow cytometry, looking at CAST 51% compared to 18%. These are studies from United States, from Europe, from Asia, really from multiple different sources. And what is consistent about most of the studies is that none of these automated systems detect urine acanthocytes. I know Jose Tessera in Brazil is developing uh, a, a modality to develop to detect acanthocytes, but um, I have never, I don't know if anybody has ever received a report from a hospital lab describing urine acanthocytes. So this is something that we, we, are, uh, we should do uh, for patient care ourselves. So yeah, that I'll uh, add one comment there that's interesting is the automated analyzers will occasionally um, pick up acanthocytes as yeast. Uh, they'll read them as budding yeast, and you'll get a report that says three plus budding yeast with three plus blood, and there's no <laughs> yeast in the urine. They're all acanthocytes because they look similar to an automated imager or a flow cytometer. Absolutely, and that's exactly the reason why. One of the uh, posts that we share in a urine sediment of the month in Renal Fellow Network a few months ago, or maybe a year ago, it was exactly about the distinction between acanthocyte and yeast and, 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 uh, and yeast. And we also comment on acanthocytes and crenated RBCs that was discussed earlier. But yes, as a great example, Jay, of, of uh, inaccurate identification of structures in, in the urinary sediment. Uh, it looks like there's uh, just a couple questions I see on the chat that I, I want to answer real quick. Um, someone asked, is provider-performed microscopy billable? 
It is, but it's very unsatisfying. It's about five to ten dollars for a lot of work, um, and it requires clear documentation. Um, we typically don't bill for the service. We consider it as part of our consulting services in the care of the patient, but it is technically billable, but for some reason you can't bill for provider perform microscopy on the same day that a lab did a UA. So if the lab did the UA on admission and you look at the urine also, you can't bill for your services. Um, another question was, do you start immunosuppression based solely on the findings of sediment? Um, my answer is yes. Um, if I see someone with an acute nephritic sediment um, that I know has a proliferative GN or vasculitic process going on, I don't know what it is. I'll feel comfortable starting pulse steroids. I don't necessarily start other immunosuppressant agents until I've confirmed the diagnosis, but looking at the urine point of care at the time of the initial visit allows you to get some treatment started earlier rather than waiting for serologies that may take three days. Um, one other question, um, eosinophils in the urine, I think that's been touched on by a lot of people. They're really of no utility clinically. Um, yeah, those were just a few of the questions I saw. I didn't want to let those go by. All right, so we'll turn it back over to the moderators. Okay. Uh, well, we I think we have just a few more minutes left, and I really uh, enjoyed that thoroughly. Uh, I, I need to up my game. I'm working on that. I'm at the uh, buying different brands of Sternheimer Malbin stain right now, uh, stage of my uh, career of urine microscopy. Uh, but my next uh, is to, to use all the techniques in microscopy. Uh, and so I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this. We will try to get this um, up, hopefully middle of next week, um, all the videos from, from today. And I wanna go through um, what's happening tomorrow. Tomorrow is a big day of uh, kidney con the last day and we have a lot of great uh, talks planned just want to kind of go through those we will start at 8 30 in the morning and john arthur will give uh the welcome uh even though it's on we usually do the welcome on the day of the scientific sessions his welcome is always very entertaining i don't know what he has planned but it we could be moving uh the earth again um <laughs> And, and if you've been to, oops, sorry, um, so here, um, can you hear me? I think I went away. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so then we're going to have uh, several other talks about the day. And then we'll end it with the keynote address from Vandana Nayar, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and we're going to try to keep this on time tomorrow. So we really hope that you uh, come and enjoy the session tomorrow. And I think that wraps up day two of KidneyCon.